I worked at a bank for about six months and I hated it. Pure depression. So I ended up like literally hiding in the bathroom. I'd make TikToks. I always had the motivation, the drive for entrepreneurship in general. When I was in like high school, I was flipping phones. I, I flipped cars. You got a loyal girlfriend, so you're, uh, you're a third of the way there. When I first got the commercial warehouse and got my first Gaylord of books, she was there supporting me. She would go and scan books all night if I needed her to. And that's really the OG. She kept my mind going. She made sure that I was constantly trying to grow and not stay stagnant, you know? You need those people in your life. Are those contacts Sorry. still open? And would you came under some troubles fall back on books even now? That's a really good question. That is a very good question. Honestly, ready for this? No. And I say that because I found a lot more opportunities, which we'll talk a little bit, with real estate. Easier ways to make money, if that makes sense. Then Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay 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 so we transitioned a ago. sorry keep going no no no. go ahead go ahead if we asked you a couple months ago um, you said you still asked... you would still love books exactly so if you asked you a got a book ago, tattoo it might have been a little different okay so so far this is this is what we got about brian so far so brian he hated working at the bank right he fell in love with this mentor with a long beard, had 15 kids, said that he wanted to be just like him. Shout out Money Badger. Shout out Money Badger. And then because of this, this obsession, he ended up getting books and building up different warehouses. It started off with 600 square feet to 1,200 square feet to 2,000 square feet. And then now you have all these contacts and books and you have too many gay lords that you, that you know what to do with. And then you decided to jump into buying some courses, you know, jumping into wholesale. And then now if you were to turn back, you wouldn't go to books, except you'd go to real estate. Tell us more about real estate and, and your thoughts of real estate and why you wouldn't go back to books in lieu of real estate. Did I say that? Okay. You know what I mean. Yeah, no, you got it. So I'll, I'll circle back to that, but I want to mention one other thing about just my story in general. I always had the motivation, the drive for, I guess, entrepreneurship in general. When I was in like high school, I was flipping phones. I, I flipped um, cars during um, summer. So I had a sports car during the summer. I was constantly doing these things. That, there was something in me that wanted to do this um, entrepreneurship type stuff. I didn't know at the time, but that's what kind of propelled me into this. I always had it in me that I wanted to do more. Going back to the real estate portion. So this part gets really interesting. So the book landlord at the commercial properties he suggested i go to a real estate meeting he really liked me he started like stopping by the warehouse all the time talking to me got very close with him very close friends and he started um telling me i should go to this real estate meeting i i should talk to these people if anything you just learn something so i ended up going and like the first three to five times i would just get plastered every time i went i would just get drunk because <laughs> i i didn't feel comfortable around these people that like they would do this um like like what is it called like not the dd thing what is it called like the intervention like um like my name's brian and i'm an alcoholic like that type of thing but for real estate they would and, do icebreakers exactly thank you i can't even think of the word um so they would do that and like 80 90 percent of the people would say i have 40 doors i have 30 doors i own 30 properties and i'm sitting there like i got I negative one door yeah, exactly. I'm like, I got. Brian, what does a door mean? Exact. Oh, sorry. A door is um, just like a, a real estate property, specifically. It could be an apartment or a single family house. Um, just how many like actual doors you have, meaning like apartments. So, like, if you have a duplex, that's two doors. Exactly. That's what I was wondering. Right, but you didn't know this whenever you go into the alcohol anonymous meeting. No. I yeah. Wouldn't. Where you like to read DD because you drank too much, anyways. Yeah, and, and I'm like, oh, I, I later on I realized I'm like, oh, I have really bad habits. If I don't, if I'm uncomfortable, I just start drinking. That's weird. <laughs> it's okay. We can talk offline afterwards, bro. I'm here for you. I got, I got two large shoulders. If you need a, if you need a, you know. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> Cheers. The real estate portion. So, ironically, my la my landlord had like his office at that commercial property, just a separate, separate detached like building. And that was his office. And he held one of the real estate meetings there. And that was the first time I ever went there. So I ended up like showing some of the people, the book warehouse, and it, the, the faces were hilarious. Literally like walk in and they're like, 
What the? What you, <laughs> that's funny. What are you I doing? Don't with understand. That? The real estate meeting, I, I went to them and I started learning the terminology, you know, all this stuff, you know, with Amazon, like the Amazon FBA terminology, what's that? And and the merchant fulfilled and all, all this term, terminology, you know, in Amazon, same thing in real estate. They, they were saying all these different loan types and I had no idea what was going on. I just went there yeah. like a sponge and started asking questions like crazy. I mean, you're um, speaking my language. Yeah. Like I, I, I go there all the time and, and people will talk to me like I know so much. And I'm like, no, I just have been coming here for the past three years, once a month for the past three years and just start picking up on some of it. You know, I ended up trying to get a property about a year into Amazon. So like a year into Amazon, I started looking to see if I could get approved for a mortgage. And I found out that in order to do that, you have to have two years of work history, like solid, the same job. And it depends on certain situations, but that's like the bulk of what most banks will look for. Yeah. So your conventional banks. Exactly. Exactly. So then fast forward, I said, okay, I'm going to keep going to this real estate meeting. I don't know much to begin with. I'm going to go here for another year. And, and once I have that two years worth of work history, I'm going to go and buy a place. And it ended up being like, very, very good for me. Cause when I went to go look for places and get approved for a mortgage that first year, I didn't really know much. Like I just, I just wanted to like jump into it. You know what I mean? Like, like anytime you see some new opportunity, you kind of, you kind of want to jump and see what it is. Them telling me like, you might have to wait a year. It kind of pushed me to learn more um, and see different opportunities. Like, at, like at the beginning of me looking at real estate, I only knew about like long-term tenants and having regular tenants at a place I'm at a property and and making money off of that. But then throughout that year, I learned about like Airbnb and like VRBO, short term rentals and all that type of stuff. Um, so then corporate housing. Exactly. Exactly. So then fast forward um, about last year, um, like mid July, I ended up closing on a property. It was really complicated because most people have a W-2 and like a nine to five job. So like it's somewhat easier to get a mortgage because you have a lot of data set out for you. That they're like, okay, this is a stable job at a bank or whatever it is. Um, they trust that the income's coming in. Um, I ended up getting approved for a mortgage based off of my Amazon business. Yeah. So it ended up taking a lot of back and forth a hundred days to close on this property. Yeah. And I had to send in profit and loss statements and all sorts of stuff. But by yeah, the way, they run a, like a income business analysis literally. Uh, and, they, and they look at, so just, yeah. So yeah. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause they look at your taxes. They look at the trends of your income and they see if your area of business is still trending Upwards. So regardless of what you made on your taxes, they're going to label you an income regardless of what your taxes say based off what that bank thinks. So like they went even crazier and they're like, we want you to go to your accountant and get signed profit and loss statements stating that they agree that that business is, is this going to do well in the future based off of these numbers that everything's accurate. It, it just got down to the dot, but it was it taught me a lot too. Like I had no idea that they would actually end up approving me after two years of selling on Amazon. Like the, the fact that they even like saw enough income to allow me to get a property. And it, it, it was, it was a great experience overall. It was definitely a lot of headaches and, and most things are when you first start out. But um, after the hundred days to close, I ended up, um, you know, having a mortgage, but a lot of people say you own, I, I ended up getting a fourplex. So I have four separate apartments in one house room. hacking. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Literally here. <laughs> Let's go. And what does house hacking mean, Brian? What do you do? So house hacking is uh, when you um, go and get a mortgage on a property, um, such as like a duplex or so a two unit, two apartments, and you live in one and you rent out the other. And the purpose of this is so that the tenants on one of the sides of the duplex pay your mortgage. So you essentially end up living for free with no yep. bills when it comes to utilities or sometimes even your food and all of that is covered. Nice. Kind of so this is the property that it took a hundred days to close. Yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> so the, first, the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was like, were there other bids? Was there competition? Did that oh, hurt you great, at all? It's great questions. So I bought this at the peak of the market. Like 
um, there's an area near me called Ellicottville, and it's very popular for people snowboarding, skiing, and they do it like literally like 75% of the year they have like fake snow and stuff and people go snowboarding and skiing and it's huge for like short-term rentals and Airbnb. And that's kind of the stuff I want to get into. I was placing, I think I placed a total of like six different offers in that city. And the majority of them were, um, I got 15 to 20 other offers additional to mine. Like there was that many people doing bids and going over asking price. So I constantly got outbid and I eventually ended up finding this fourplex and I knew there was competition. There, it was, there was people constantly going through open houses and stuff like that. And I ended up having the mentor, which was my landlord who ran the commercial properties. He owns, I would say at least three to 4 million worth of commercial real estate. Are we still talking about money badger? No, 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 no. This is oh, the guy okay. Different who, mentor. Uh, my landlord for the oh, right. four houses. So we ended up getting really close and I ended up just asking him when I go and see these places, can you go check them out? Can you go into the basement and make sure there's no foundation issues? Like I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I don't know if the, the ceiling's going to concave. I have no idea. So I was basically having him come along with me to these properties and check them out. Cause I knew, I, I knew that he had so much knowledge on real estate as a whole. Cause it, it's, it was literally his main job. So I'd bring him around and I ended up finding this property and I ended up going X amount over the asking price because I kind of knew the competition I had and my landlord friend was able to, sh to kind of run the numbers with me and tell me that, okay, after this price, you no longer can afford it with long-term tenants or by doing it on Airbnb. You'll always end up taking money out of your bank account to pay the mortgage, which is exactly what I didn't want to do. So I, I, I ended up going as high as I could up to that point so I could always make money every month and not have to worry about paying bills. And I want it to be a profitable thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I got two follow-up questions on this whole, whole transaction. All right. All right. One, uh, one, how mad was the seller that it took you to close a hundred days? That's question one. Question two. So did you just ask above asking to, to, to have like a competitor advantage or did you use like escalation offers or? <laughs> so this was great. So this is life. And this is a great example of life. So you go into it and you're like, oh, I hope he, he um, accepts escalation clauses, which is for the people that don't know, it's like bidding on eBay. Like you can go back and forth. Some sellers um, put puts in an offer over yours and yours will go up to a certain amount. It's like a limit. For this property, of course, like life is, no escalation clauses. You must submit your highest and best offer. <laughs> so I ended up trying to hit the, the max amount that I was comfortable with where I knew I could make money on this. And I'm like, I'm not going to do anything below that. And I'm not going to do anything over it. Cause I, even if I, I want to make sure I get it. That was the end solution. I want to make sure I got, got it. And I want to make sure I didn't end up losing money on it. So I, I kind of did that, that middle ground where I was comfortable with. How long ago was this? Closed in July of last year. Okay. Are you happy with your purchase? I am. I am. <laughs> it's I, I so I'm fully comfortable with talking numbers. I ended up spending sixty grand over asking, and the properties wow. are valued at um, about twenty grand under that. So I I I, I bought it for four ten, and the building is now worth um, four. Four hundred and forty thousand currently. That's wow. how crazy the market is right now. <laughs> so four ten sixty over asking. So you basically offered like fifteen. Oh, sorry, 20. sorry, my bad. So sixty over off over asking was the four ten. Okay, okay, crazy. Hey, but you locked it in, and now you got a nice piece of real estate. Your house yeah. Actually. So fa fast forward, like the stuff that people don't want, don't talk about. I had, I had no idea what I was doing with real estate. I had never done drywall before. Paint. I literally hadn't painted anything. My like my parents like would paint walls growing up, and they wouldn't allow me to to, to freaking paint. So it was a large learning curve, just like Amazon to someone who's never sold online before. And I ended up um, renovating all four units, um, doing a lot of it myself. But when it came to like flooring and stuff like that, I hired out. Um, but it was a large learning curve getting started in it. Um, but fast forward, it's been 
a year and a month now, basically. And I had I live in one, and then the other three are completely furnished, active Airbnb on Airbnb. So no long term rentals. No long term rentals. And the, the other interesting part that people don't want to talk about is I bought this with three long term tenants, so I oh, had to wow. find a way to get them out. What's the reason behind that strategy? So the reason be um, you're saying the Airbnb portion. Yeah. So the Airbnb portion is basically a way to get a. 50% to 100% markup on rents. So whereas a uh, one bedroom, one bath in this area, let's say it goes for a grand, um, on Airbnb, it would do 1,500 to 2,000 a month. Assuming what utilization rate or whatever you would call yeah, it. Yeah, so, so the, it's funny because it relates to Airbnb very well. The way we determine like the occupancy, how, how often it's gonna be booked, what your nightly prices are, is all based off of a data and we love data and Amazon and we love yeah. softwares. Do you have a keeper? Yeah. So literally, so it's called AirDNA.com. Yeah. I've heard it's of it. Plug. Uh, <laughs> so they're the go-to when determining how often is someone going to book your place per month, what amount of income you're going to estimate it to get um, and all that good stuff. And I kind of just went, honestly, I went balls deep in it. I'm like, let's see what happens. Worst case scenario, I, I put long-term tenants back in and go from there. And I, I ended up working out. It's been over a year now. Cool. So assuming AirDNA's projected occupancy rate, you get 50 to 100% more. Exactly. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I was wondering like, why not at least keep one long-term rental to have that consistent. But like you said, you can always convert back to long-term. Always. That, that's, that's pretty much the key. I know people who do that all the time. So I know people that will, that they have a like um, different section. So they'll have a four unit building and they'll have two of them long-term and two of them Airbnb to try to mitigate the risk. And I think it, it's super smart. I think it's, I think it has to do something with the fact that I'm young and I know I'm willing to deal with all the chaos of immediately going to Airbnb and having to going with learning the process of king, kicking out t tenants and all that, I'm willing to take the headaches for the extra income. I'm willing to risk a little more if that makes sense. Yeah. So does Air DNA help help you out with like your pricing strategies or how do you come up with DNA. price? Yeah, Air yes. DNA DNA. So they give you an idea. You can they have something called Rentalizer specifically. Big keys, big keys, by the way, uh, Rentalizer. You type in your address. It's all free. It's literally, you can pay for the software, but you don't have to. You can literally just go in and use it. So there's a section called Rentalizer. You put in the location, the exact address, and they give you drop downs, and it says how many bedrooms you have, how many bathrooms you have, how many people can you hold in this place, meaning bags and stuff. You put that in and it will tell you how much you should be uh, on average, someone with, you know, a two bedroom, two bath, how much on average they they charge in that area and how much you should approximately get with your two bedroom at that address. It literally goes that specific, which is nice. It gives you an idea of like kind of what occupants you, you'll have. Yeah. Like you'll literally see the numbers get skewed based off of if you live closer to the water or if you live closer to the village. And you, you can see that when you plug in the addresses, how it changes. Yeah, that's sick. And so, so you're a year deep into this. And so when are you going to buy your next uh, building slash property? <laughs> so I – I was just about to put in an offer with, with a five unit because I learned a lot of valuable stuff this week. This week has been like mind blowing. Um, when you hit properties, when you're looking at properties that have five units, five apartments or more in them, um, you now are considered um, like a commercial loan versus a residential loan is four units and under. So if you're looking at a five unit or bigger, yeah, they yeah. now will approve you based off of the property's current income, not yours. Wow. So it's very easy to get approved for a commercial loan, five units or more, than it is to get approved for a four unit like me with all my profit and loss statements. And they had to look at the, my Amazon business and my income. And you don't have to deal with that when it comes to commercial. That's huge. Yeah. So how does that impact loan terms though? Is it a shorter term? So you got um, typically 20 to 25 years, they have you at a fixed interest rate. After that, you have to refinance into a different interest rate. 
Interesting. And what are down payment expectations on a commercial? So that's that's the caveat of it. That's that's how it, it kind of sucks because it's it's kind of like a, they have a lot more capital to play in that game. Um, it's twenty percent down is the standard. Um, but I'm also learning this uh, week that there's different ways to get around it. You can um, talk to people, find companies um, that do what's called hard money loans, and they'll basically fund the whole deal for you. And then you pay them X amount of interest rate um, within a year. So you would literally refinance at the end of the year to get your money out and pay them back. So it, it's a way to get past the 20% down. So I've been learning a little bit about that. It's definitely very high level. And it's it's been a lot of coffees, a lot of late nights. Yeah. Uh, a lot of coffees. A lot of AA a lot of, meetings too, right? A lot of literally. monsters. A lot. Oh, dude, I love the white. That's my go-to. That's the best that one. Is cool. It's better than uh, Celsius or whatever it's called. Yeah, I agree. Hundred percent agree. All right. All right so we do. Going back to your current property, I'm curious what your down payment was on that. If you don't mind sharing, at least maybe a percentage. Yeah, I don't. I don't mind sharing at all. I would say total, and this is an estimate, probably within like two or three percent. Um, I paid a roughly like twenty grand down. Wow, that um, seems pretty low. And how much? Did, how much did it take 5%? you to like renovate? So you put twenty k down. How much did it cost you to like renovate? Not renovate. Did you do? You, you didn't do any renovation, did you? It was already ready. No, to... I. So I did. I did a lot of it. I did myself. So I literally like did painting nice. myself. Literally, my girlfriend and I. So thank God. Thank God. And Find a loyal girl. <laughs> Find a loyal girl. Um, a, lot, a lot of late nights painting and stuff. I, I did flooring. The The biggest expense really became um, furnishing for Airbnb. They want- Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, so they want couches, beds, all that stuff. I, I honestly spent, so furnishing wise, it was like around 3,500 for two of the units, doubling that. So we're talking about like seven grand for two of the units. Um, the other units are bigger. They're they're um, a three bedroom and a two bedroom. Those are more around five grand each. So I would say for furnishing about seventeen grand, um, and then renovation was was I, I would say just about ten to eleven grand type of thing. All Amazon money, by the way. This is all like hashtag like, Amazon paid for it. Yeah, yeah. Like, hashtag like, like, Amazon like, paid for it. Let's go. People don't believe in Amazon and all that shit. Like that was the whole thing's funded by Amazon. The the down payment, the renovation, everything. Brian, what I'm hearing though is still a, a fairly substantial amount of money. Twenty K on the down payment, twenty K or so um and other expenses. What if someone doesn't have that kind of money? I mean, would you recommend they wait and save up or do you have some other tips for how they might be able to get started in real estate? Oh, so so I got two. So the 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 big key if if you were to just have let's let's say you just have 20 grand just enough to buy the property um and and, and they're not all this expensive it's just it being a four unit and i bought it at the peak of the real estate market and everything i would suggest not converting the units until airbnb until you have the money to do that so leaving the long-term rent um tenants in there um, a lot of people will buy the properties and the the tenants will already be there and they'll be at very low rents that wouldn't pay the mortgage. The day you buy the property and you get in there, according to New York state law, you can immediately increase rents as long as it's within 5% of yeah. the current rent. Around. Yeah. So you can immediately increase rents and have it paying your mortgage. Um, and you can always start small too. You can do a duplex, triplex type of thing. The other portion of it is if you want to get into real estate, but don't want to own property, but want to do Airbnb, um, people do what's called subleasing. I have many friends that do this, where they will basically pay a landlord monthly as like as if they're a tenant, and they'll have a contract with them that says that they can do Airbnb. So they'll Airbnb that unit instead of living there, and they'll make the extra money. And that's, they literally start, people start businesses with multiple properties like this, just paying landlords. Yeah. Shout out Taylor Jones. He does that. Yeah. And I found He's out recently. Also from New York. Oh yeah. Duh. I know all this. Taylor Jones yeah. is Rochester. Never met him, but he's uh, 40 minutes from me. I go up oh, to wow. Rochester every Monday to play basketball. Never met him. But I, I, I finally wow. did it in Miami last year, but the real estate stuff, it's, it's definitely, you know, what card you're dealt, meaning how much money you have and stuff like that. And, you know, the timing of the market and everything. I, I never suggest that it's, um, there's a time to buy and a time not to buy. Real estate is always appreciating. Um, you can always find the right deal that will allow you to cash flow. 
So it's there's always it's always the right time to buy real estate. Whether interest rates are super high or super low, it's always a great time. Time Except in the market beats timing the market. It really does. It really does. Crazy. It, it's been a journey and a half to say the least. Like I, I feel like I've lived in this property for like four years and it's been one year. That just goes to show how much like, I don't know, how much constant work that I'm I'm doing to learn and grow right now, you know? Bro, I think at this point, Brian is the, the mentor. He is the guru. With all I don't feel like it. Knowledge You're missing the long beard and the 15 kids though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get. I mean, he, he, he <laughs> says he has the little, girl. little girlfriend, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me say it again. I missed that part. You got a loyal girlfriend, so you're oh. you're a third of the way there. Yeah, bro. Dude, dude she just she, paint she, walls with you and doing prep with OG, you. Man. How far away is it to have kids with her? I mean, let's be <laughs> fifteen kids specifically. She's yeah. smiling over here in the corner. She just walked fast. <laughs> oh, she oh, wants shoot. fifteen kids. Oh, okay. oh wow! Yeah. All right, Yikes. all right. I might be in the doghouse. I haven't even met her yet. No, no, it's funny. It's funny. She's laughing in the corner. She loves this shit. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's really the OG though. Like, like when I first got the commercial warehouse and got my first Gaylord of books, she was there supporting me. She she would go and scan books all night if if I needed her to. And that that's really the OG. Like she she kept my mind going. She made sure that I was constantly trying to grow and not stay stagnant. You know, it's really key. You, you need those people in your life. And, and I and I'm not even preaching like like I have them. I don't. Like I'm constantly trying to find people. I'm constantly going to the real estate meetings, trying to make new friends. I'm always a sponge. I definitely know that I know a lot, but I am constantly trying to learn more.